Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and let's get to part two of getting into the hard. And what we're going to do in this series is look at a couple of cases as a way of covering numerous topics. So I show you this case, and I say the patient's short of breath, and uh, Echo showed a high-velocity shunt, and CTA was ordered to look for things. Now, when you look at this very quickly, the first thing you notice is the patient has plaque in the left main and LED. doesn't look all that impressive, and you're really not jumping at anything. But let me show you a little bit more closely two other images. And again, you don't see a whole lot, perhaps, but the plaque and the LED. But what if I ask you, what is this under the circle, in the circle? Hmm, you think about it. Let me show it to you again. What if I go give you this image and I say, what is that dot? What is that vessel over there? Well, you know, one of the things 3D works very well is changing the perspective. And so what if I showed you this perspective of the vessel and then I was able to say, what is that vessel right there? There's a vessel that's going upward between the pulmonary artery and the ascending aorta. What are we dealing with? Well, if you take that from the volume rendering and then you create a different view in color, you see that actually that vessel is going on top of the pulmonary artery. It looks almost like a button. And here it is again, and there's actually vessels going to the left and right on top of the pulmonary artery. And if you look at it on these four views and look at this with a little bit of motion, you see we're going to scroll through the data sets you know, and just follow that vessel upward. And whether we're looking at it from an axial or a coronal display, or we look at it in 3D, you can clearly see the vessel, and you can clearly see the vessel and the orientation. So it's really a vessel that we track upward, going up into the pulmonary artery like a button type appearance. So think about that for a second, and I'm going to ask you a couple questions. So the first question is a simple one. What's the best diagnosis? Well, thinking about it, there wasn't an anomalous left coronary, and it wasn't an anomalous right coronary. It wasn't an aneurysm, but it was a fistula. And so that was the unusual example of a coronary artery fistula. And the patient went to surgery. The patient had the two visible communications, one from the ramus intermedius artery, which came up on the left of the main PA. And then there was another one which came from the left coronary and one on the right side. And that explains how you got those two vessels and that button appearance. This was ligated, and the patient did great. So coronary artery fistula is something you need to know. It's an abnormal communication between the coronary and another vascular structure, be it artery, vein, or chamber. Its most common drainage is to the right ventricle, right atrium, and then pulmonary artery, but it can drain almost anywhere. The right coronary is involved in about two-thirds of these cases. The coronary is usually dilated and tortuous. Surgery is typically the treatment of choice. Patients' presentations can be from shortness of breath to hemodynamic issues, similar to ASD or VSD, to ischemia. And about 90% of coronary artery fistulas drain into the right atrium, coronary sinus, or right ventricle. If you ask me what's the etiology, congenital is most common, but trauma, procedures, or bypass surgery, for example, all can be causes. In terms of the presentation, incidental finding on CT or autopsy, or again, as in this case, patients could have symptoms. So a very important diagnosis article by Zenos a couple years back made the point that CT is very good with 3D mapping of defining the presence and extent of these fistula. And here's just a great example of a coronary artery fistula of the right coronary artery. And you can see it's a mega right coronary artery, just a very typical appearance. Okay, another case. Patient has a past medical history. Uh, of coronary disease, has GERD, was shoveling snow, never shoveled snow, had chest pain, went to the ER, and eventually made it to Hopkins. The emergency uh, cardiac cath was done, uh, which showed left circumflex occlusion. And so let's take a look at the CTA we did. 
When you look at the images, you see the patient's right uh, coronary, you see the left main coronary, you see the LAD, you see the origin of the circumflex on the second set of images, but you realize the circumflex is occluded just past its origin. When you look a little bit more carefully, there's a second circular thing, about a centimeter in size, right past the patient's circumflex. If I take you from these images to these images and I show you it has rim-like calcification, it's circular and I ask you the question, what is this? What's the key finding beyond that coronary? And I give you a bunch of choices. It's not a fistula like the last case. It's not an anomalous coronary. And it's not stenosis per se. Yes, the patient does have occlusion of the circumflex. It's a coronary artery aneurysm. And here it is again, just a going back, similar views, same case. You can see there's a circular structure with calcification. That's a coronary artery aneurysm. And so that is the correct diagnosis. Now let me ask you a little bit about coronary artery aneurysms. What's the most common cause worldwide? Key word is worldwide. And the answer is going to be Kawasaki's disease. If I ask the question, the most common cause in the U.S., then you would have to say atherosclerotic disease. There are a number of causes of coronary artery aneurysms, Kawasaki's, Takayashu's, atherosclerotic disease, as well as traumatic and iatrogenic causes. And as I mentioned, atherosclerotic causes, U.S., Kawasaki's worldwide, but there is a long list. Even now, Lois Dietz is one of the conditions. Now, if I ask you, what is a coronary artery aneurysm? It's defined as a 50% or greater increase in the coronary artery diameter compared to adjacent segments. If I ask you the question, what vessel is most commonly involved? It's the right coronary is number one, followed by LAD and circumflex. They're uncommon lesions. People talk about an incidence of under 2%. But when you get angiography, it may be as high as 5%. But in the general population, under 2%. Now, if I look at the causes, I look at Kawasaki's, those are going to be young patients. It's not a 70-year-old, right? Under 5, peak age 2, male greater than female, more common in Asians, especially Japanese. It's typically a syndrome with acute febrile illness. It's also known as mucotanous lymph node syndrome. In Kawasaki's, the patient gets a number of cardiac abnormalities from pericardial effusion to mitral regurg to myocarditis to coronary artery aneurysms and everything in between. When you talk about coronary artery aneurysms, you recognize an 11-year-old, if you see one, it's going to be Kawasaki's. This case also very nicely shows you the patient can present with chest pain. Issues are that often Kawasaki's is not diagnosed, and that's when you have problems. And just a nice example here. Kawasaki's also gives multiple aneurysms. They can be calcified. Here's two aneurysms in the right coronary artery. This article by Han made the point that cardiac CT is excellent at looking at patients' aneurysms in patients with uh, Kawasaki's disease. And here's another case. Again, in terms of coronary artery aneurysms, look how large it is. Now, I've seen several cases we have coronary artery aneurysms that actually present on non contrast CT as a chest mass. That's what this looked like, a node on the initial interpretation. But you can see where's the right coronary artery. That's a right coronary artery aneurysm. Look at its size. And here's another one with volume rendering showing you the aneurysm, the soft tissue mass around the aneurysm, the visualization of the right coronary, and this is with cinematic rendering, kind of a cool look at the coronary artery and the coronary artery aneurysm. Complications of coronary artery aneurysms, thrombosis, embolic phenomena, fistulization, spasm, rupture, and hemopericardium, of course, when it occurs, it's a really bad sign. Now, in terms of management with coronary artery aneurysms, typically medical therapy, but if that doesn't work, stent or bypass will be the procedure of choice. Okay, let's look at another case now. Patient has a complex history of depression and anxiety, had chest pain, stress test was negative, patient was insistent on a coronary CTA, which was obtained, and look at the images. You see the patient's right coronary, and now you see it bifurcating into two vessels. 
what's going on there? You look a little bit more closely and what you really see is that the patient's left main coronary artery is coming off the right coronary just beyond its origin. And you can look at that and see that in 3D as well. When you look at it in motion, you could follow it down and you could see, look at you as you follow the images, look at the patient's origin of the right main coronary, then you see the right coronary and then you see another vessel which is the left. And you can see that in 2D, you can rotate it around in 3D views, particularly from above, you can see it with motion, but a very nice example as we look through of the single vessel bifurcating. So I've already cheated and kind of told you the answer, but if I ask you what's the best diagnosis, right coronary off the left main, left main coronary from the right cusp, left main off proximal right, or coronary artery fistula, you now know when you look at the images and you look at the motion that you're talking about the left main coronary arising off the proximal right coronary artery. And here's just an illustration of that, a very nice example, illustration matching the real picture. Now, what's important about this case is where that coronary artery is going. That coronary artery is going between the ascending aorta and the main pulmonary outflow tract. And so that course is typically called interarterial. And here's a list of the four possible courses, but this is interarterial. And in looking at coronary artery anomalies, the left main arises from the sinus of Valsalva, right coronary, or as a common trunk with the RCA in 0.1% of patients. And in 75% of these, the left has a course that's intraarterial. So this matches very nicely. The fact is there are numerous pathways for the left main coronary arising from the right between the aorta and pulmonary artery, as in this case, upper ventricular septum, anterior to the PA, between the aorta and left atrium. So there are four pathways, but the one that's of concern to us in this case, and typically of concern, is interarterial. Again, the reason is because the other three are considered clinically insignificant, with interarterial being considered significant, often referred to as a malignant anomaly. So again, think about those possibilities. And that's just a very nice case. Okay, let's look at another case. In terms of the patient, what was done, um, the patient was treated conservatively. There was concern that doing surgery would have a very, very high risk. The patient is currently being managed conservatively. So it's very important to realize when you're looking at coronary arteries, this whole idea about interarterial course, here's a more classic where the right coronary is coming off the left cusp, tracking between the ascending aorta and pulmonary outflow tract. You can see it very nicely in this image. You can see it very nicely as we look at the motion-related studies here, following it through. And again, the problem, of course, you can see from the images, if you're sitting in the, uh, between the ascending aorta and the main pulmonary trunk, you're gonna be compressed. And that's the reason the patients get sudden death. And here's just a very nice example showing you that picture. And again, the importance in this case of both uh, vessels arising from a single cusp. When you look at coronary artery anomalies, a lot has been written. Uh, CT, we pick them up more commonly now. Some are of academic interest, but others can be the cause of the patient's chest pain and can impact the patient's lifespan, and intervention will be necessary. Overall, the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young adults are in descending order of frequency, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, coronary artery anomalies with an intraarterial or intramural cause, and ARVC. So coronary anomalies are indeed number two. So let's do this. Why don't we take a break right here, and then we'll come back and do a few more cases. See you in a few moments. Bye.